So next is uh, William Arias, and he's going to talk about deploying the machine learning bots uh, like a boss using CI/CD. Um, William Arias, you you work for GitLab, is that correct? Hello. Yes, I work at GitLab. Yeah, perfect. So you're the expert. No. So uh, <laughs> right, where are you joining from, by the way? I am I am from Colombia, but I live in Prague, in Czech Republic. Ah, right. So it's a good time zone for you now, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, excellent. Okay, so please start sharing your screen and then uh, you can take it away. Okay, hello everyone. So my name is William. And today I want to share with you some of the learnings I had uh, since I started like back in 2016 working with developing bots. And I'm a big fan of NLP and the, well, the use cases of a chatbot. And in this, in this talk, I want to introduce you to how you can step up your game using principles of continuous integration and continuous delivery, using RASA, the uh, framework for chatbots, and GitLab CI CD. So why, why, why I decided that I wanted to share these, these learnings with, with you? It's because when you start working on this uh, as a hobbyist or uh, as professional, I uh, have done both. Usually what you do is that you start behaving like a one person band. So I, I, I was reviewing the agenda of the, of the talks today. And if you have been following as well, you can see that there are presentations that they are teaching you how to create a Docker file, how to deploy a model using Docker, how to serve it. So you have to create an API. And besides, you have to use other tools uh, for, to create a model itself. And at the end, we start behaving more or less like this, like, like I don't know if you, if, if you like the symptoms. When I was doing that, I remember this guy because we are a one, one person band. We are playing all the instruments. So you start becoming, so, or, or you are expected to deliver a, 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 an application that contains, that has machine learning embedded you more or less have to behave like a one person band and know a lot of instruments. And to learn how to play these instruments, there is a learning curve that might be frustrating. I was the other day um, teaching an assistant, um, uh, yeah, teaching assistant in some uh, online course where the students, they were able to create the model for a chatbot but then when they were asked to please deploy to AWS and show us, give us an endpoint where we can connect a channel and use the bot, many of them, they, they start struggling because that's not what you are supposed to necessarily be aware of. You know, the models, you, you know how to, how to use different libraries to create the, to classify intents, to classify entities, but not necessarily all the tooling that you are expected to more or less uh, do, do, uh, have some, 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 some knowledge to be able to serve a model. So example, let's say you use TensorFlow for something for, uh, to create some, some, sort of, some cl classification problem, to solve some classification problem. So you prototype in Jupyter Notebook. And once you prototype in Jupyter Notebook, you, you, if you want to store, the, and probably you will need a database. So you need to know which one should I use. Should I use something like Cassandra, for example, or Postgre, MySQL? And then as, 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 as I was saying before, then if you start digging into this, you will, for sure you will find, okay, so I should deploy it as a container and then Kubernetes and how do I deploy it? Should I create a virtual machine or should I go directly to the platform as a service or should I just use an API software as a service, whatever, and next to serve it to the other world. So all of these things, uh, they are more or less what they call today the full stack, machine learning engineer or data scientist, I don't know. And I want to share with you what was the approach that I follow and how today, if your purpose or if the challenge that you are facing is, I want to create, I don't know, my own startup in which I will build chatbots for whatever business. And you want to be fast and you want to deploy in a very, very like close to a standard, professional way, but also with iteration in mind and being fast. So I want to show you how I did it, how am I doing it? And this is not like written in stone. This can change and all these workflows, you, if you know the principles, then you can adapt it to your own workflow. So how, how, is the, the, how I started to, to divide this, this problem when I say, 
it's taking me too much to deploy a chatbot to production. It works in my machine, the typical one. It works in my machine. It's very easy to run it in local host, but I want to deploy it. And, and if you are doing this for yourself as a one person band or for a company, you will find these, these challenges. So first, I started thinking of it like what they are calling these days machine learning operations, that this could be a, a workflow of that. This, this talk is not necessarily about ML ops, but it borrows some concepts from there. So first you are aware that the model that you are creating has a, some, some life cycle in which you have to go through all these steps that these are the ones that we are, we are expected to be knowledgeable in how can I ingest the data, how can I version it or label it and run the validation test, train a model, fine tune it, hyperparameters, analysis, reading all these learning curves, and then deploy and then get feedback. So this is the, only the model, but one of the things that I learned that is very important when you want to scale these solutions and when you are not only developing for yourself, but it, this even helps if it's for yourself, because when you move to the process view of what you are attempting to do, the first person that will be grateful three weeks later or a month later, it's yourself. You say, oh, that's so good that I put it in this, in this view, because now you understand all the steps and um, more or less how you can ex ex split the responsibilities. And I put here that one of them is a dialogue contributor because one of the things I have found while working, developing chatbots with Russell Library or others is that you might be the, let's say expert, I don't like that word, but you might be the most knowledgeable person in how to build the, the, the bot, but you are not necessarily the subject matter expert of the topic that the bot is supposed to provide a service. And in many cases, the subject matter expert is a person that they are not developers or they are no, they don't have any uh, computer science software engineering background, but they are the ones that they know what should be the training data that you feed to the bot. They know what type of questions the, the, the end users will, will, will ask. So in this way, you also can start enabling other type of profiles in how can I incorporate their, their contributions to my process to create a better bot. So this is a process view that it contains many of the steps from the model lifecycle view. And what are the benefits of this? When you, when you do this, first is a favor that you do to yourself, but also you have a common understanding of this process for, for everyone. So if next time there is an iteration that something should change, now it's very easy for, let's say, some, some new employee or, or for you one month later to retake and say, oh, okay, this is, this is what I was doing, here is where I am. And, and when you use this process modeling as well, you can identify bottlenecks or where the things that you are doing might be failing. And also this enables you with some standard that will enable iteration so you can improve with the pass of time, the performance of the chat. And now, like, how does this look? So the components view. And here, this is the high level diagram of what I have architected that it works to, to a very decent uh, level in which this, this could be the uh, pilot or prototype, but very decent, not, not POC hackathon level, very decent pilot that we will go uh, step by step and I will show you starting from, from this part. So what is in, the, in this part in the left, the dialogues or Python code, this is your development environment. This is where you have your PyCharm or Visual Studio, Sublime Text, whatever. Here is where you have the, your code or someone can be creating dialogues uh, in the certain format for your bot. So the only thing you do once you invest time learning principles of CI, CD is that you work in your machine. Once you are happy with your changes or with whatever you did in your local environment, you do git commit and git push to remote. So what I am doing in my workflow is that I create, I make a change, or in this case, for this example, I am adding more dialogues to the bot. So the bot knows, knows more combinations and is able to have better conversations. This push will automatically, and from here, everything is automatic. Back in the day, let's say four years ago, when I started before using this, you have to use the command, command line and know each one of the commands that, for example, the RASA framework provides 
to do RASA train, RASA cross validate, or RASA test data, all of these things. So here, what is, what is happening is that once I commit the code automatically uh, using GitLab CI, it will start, it will start some runners or, uh, or containers or it's called runner that each one of these will run the steps that you usually will run manually. So this is not, nothing new for someone who, is, who has been working in traditional development for years. But this is more tailored for people that maybe they come with a math background or they are breaking into machine learning and they would like to build bots. This is not necessarily knowledge that they have. At least, for example, I didn't have it four years ago when I started these, these good practices of software delivery. So now that I discovered it, that's why I said, oh, this, is, this makes my life easier. I want to share with you. So these, these, these steps that are usually executed manually, they start running in different machines. So one, one, one runner is going to validate that the data that you push to, to the repository, it's okay. The format is, is, the, is the one that the bot requires. Then the, the, the data is complete. Uh, it will train the model and it will test the model. And by test the model here um, is the concept of testing in machine learning. This, you, can, you can either create a testing a test, test data set that you will run against your model, or you can do, for example, it, in this case of my demo, I do cross validation with the data that I have available. So assuming that each one of these steps is successful, then the model gets created. So you have an artifact now, and the, the, the artifact is your model. And if you are happy with the performance, because when you test the model, you will get some metrics of the performance of your model. And if you are happy with that, you say, okay, so now I want to do a merge request and, and I want to put my bot into the main branch and this will deploy and this will deploy to production or staging or pre-prod. And here, this part of the paper trail, this is, this is one of the, the key, key, key steps in machine learning operations that I am borrowing and bringing into this, into this pipeline of, of serving chatbots is that whatever you do, whatever you, you change you make in your dialogues or in your code, this, by running these pipelines, this will create a paper trail. And what does it mean? You will have a, a record of, for example, this is snapshot of today, the, mo the model that was created today, what type of da training data it used, what was the code at that moment. So in other words, this is version control that is getting into a record that I post in a wiki. And if someday you work in a company that they will get some audit and they have to show, show me why your model uh, was executing these predictions. So you can easily go to the history of commits and say, look, this model had this training data and these were the parameters and here is the code and here is the data that we used to train. So this is the paper trick that this is required. In, 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 in the enterprise. And also, if you are just playing, this paper trail helps you to keep track of your experiments and, and have some sort of report in which you can uh, compare if, you, if whatever changes you were making was improving or deteriorating the performance of your model. So once the model is ready and I'm happy with everything and all the steps and the testing from the software engineering point of view and machine learning is successful and I'm happy with everyone, everything, what I do here is that using this uh, RASA framework, it provides uh, API REST that you can deploy a model server, the, the model server in whatever you want. In my case, I'm using it in Google Cloud. And then you can use this API, API REST API to put more and make it active. And once the model is, is, um, is there, then it's, it could be available to be tested by real users or, or other people that they can serve as testers of your bot, of your dialogues. And, but it doesn't finish there because at the, till this point, I could be quite happy that the only thing I had to do was let's update the knowledge base of my bot. Let's just do git add, git commit, git push. It goes automatically through all of these steps. I don't have to worry about uh, putting manually uh, executing commands and checking pe uh, performance metrics because I can build a logic that if it's above certain threshold, it's okay. But once you are there and the model is served, 
in, in this model server and is ready to take conversations, it's very important to close the loop with some feedback. And the way that I've been using this, and I will show later, is that I am using the same uh, REST API that provides the uh, RASA framework to extract a uh, record of dialogues or conversations that the bot has been having with real users. So what, what, what you can do here is that when you expose it to the outer world and the bot is interacting with real people using different uh, ways to say hi or to express an intent, you can bring this back to, 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 to your environment and some sort of data playground. And here you can do what you like the most. That is, okay, let's use pandas, Python libraries to analyze, uh, to, to, to do NLP in other words. And from there, you can extract insights to later feed it back into the bot and retrain it and start continuing this, what I say before, this loop that enables iteration to improve the bot performance. So more or less what I'm telling you is that you, you could be a one person band, but you can also bring a conductor to your orchestra someone or something in this case technology that will help you orchestrate all of these manual steps and at the end of the day by using these principles of continuous integration and delivery will step up your game creating bots um, very important really it will make your life easier i am a testimony of that i used to to, to before as i was saying with the, the other um, with the other talks I, I had to, sometimes when I wanted to make some change and the change was minimal, like adding just one more sentence or changing. Uh, it happened to us um, building a bot for this topic that uh, have it here, uh, have us here online. That is when we were building a bot like two months ago for frequent asked questions about uh, coronavirus. One day we were, the bot was supposed to answer, no, don't use mask because mask should be used only by health professionals. One day later, no, 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 the bot should reply, yes, yes, use, use, create, make your own mask and, and please use it. So it was only one single change in one sentence of the bot. And it will imply that you have to maybe jump into the uh, Docker image, make the change, many things here. The only thing you have to do is just put it in your, in your pie chart, in your local environment, update it, git commit, git push, and this will take care of that. So uh, this is how and in this case I'm in PowerPoint, Keynote, so everything works in Keynote. So I want to show you a video of how it could look like. So this, uh, I will share with you also a link. This is public on YouTube. So here, typical developer workflow. I'm just creating a branch in which I want to work on my changes. So once I create the branch, I'm using the, I'm, this is the RASA format to, or to, to, to add intents or knowledge to the bot. I'm just adding two words. Okay, I am, I'm just adding two words here. Um, git add, git commit. And, and here after I, I commit the changes and I will push, uh, I will push them. Here is where the, where the magic starts because I'm pushing to, to remote and in the remote, which is GitLab, is where I have configured all this orchestration with my new, newly hired conductor for my or orchestra. So typical, typical, let's say, developer workflow. This is creating a merge request that when I come here and I, this started automatically. Once I did the push, automatically this started to run this pipeline. One of the steps are ensuring that when the bot is ready is because it's really ready to be deployed to, to production. And each one of these steps, what they are doing is what I described in the diagram before, is testing that the format or the template that we need to feed the, the training data to the bot is, is correct. It's testing, it's creating the model. And once that is creating a model, it's testing the model. So typical developer workflow with the good practices. So here, what I'm showing is that I'm going one runner by runner. And these are the, the, the different machines that are executing automatically the steps that I, that I, if I don't have this, I will have to do manually in, in command line. So by using these runners, 
I am orchestrating automatically all these stages following good practices of development. And here, this is how my, my, my workflow or pipeline uh, looks like. This is what the, the, the bot, the, what I did, what I provoked with this Git commit is that, is, as I mentioned before, these are the stages that it, it, for this branch, they will end up writing a report that the report is, is to say, is this what will show me that the different artifacts that were created like these ones, different artifacts that get created when I train the model, such as, I don't know, a histogram showing the prediction confidence distribution or a JSON file that is showing me also some, some sort of report of how the bot uh, perform based on that. But this, this JSON is pretty helpful, but it's not nice, let's say, for a business person that they just want to show me, show me how it looks like in a nicer way. So when I, in the, this is step that is called write reports, what it's doing is in same GitLab is writing in the wiki, a uh, report of the experiment where you can auto-generate this thing that you can later revisit or, 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 or keeping some track of the changes of your experiments of the, or, or of the model that is in production. So once I'm happy with everything, I can merge the, the changes to my bot. And here, when I start merging, this is a view of the RASA, RASA model server in which, as you can see, at that moment when I, when I took this video, the model that was active was a model of last Sunday. But here, this was Wednesday. I'm running a pipeline that is merging the changes into the main, main branch. That once this, this pipeline will, will, will finish, what it will show, show, show us here is about to, to finish in the deploy stage. There, right there, what is going on is that my, my pipeline is talking to the model server, to Rasa server, and it's saying, I am ready. The model went through all of the steps. Please deploy. And um, once this is successful, as we can see there, I will refresh this page and you can see that now the model is ready, was automatically deployed and made active. And from there, I can use tools like the, the ones that Rasa offer to create a link to share this newly created bot with external people so they can test it. And I can also leverage an approach of conversation driven development because from here, before re deploying, before following these steps that I just followed, and de deploying to production, you can have more feedback of how the bot is performing. So as, as, if you appreciate the, the beauty of this, you were working in PyCharm, you made two or three changes, you git commit, git push, and all of these things started automatically. And to, to finish, the, to close the loop, I want to show you the last part, is that in this case, I am, I am using the API from Rasa, and I'm bringing, I, Okay, we have five minutes and I'm using the, the API from, from Rasa to bring some of the dialogues or conversations that the bot had. So this bot was newly created only for this event. So it doesn't have too much, uh, too many, uh, too much data, but this can give you an idea that here, the sky is the limit. You can say, okay, I want to filter by number of intents, by the, the confident, highest confidence of the best intent or what is the type of token that people are using the most? Are they saying hello the way I thought or are they saying hello, I want this? Are they using two multi intent in one sentence? And for example, in this one, I was just extracting the last word. And this, for example, could give me a glimpse that look, if the people are saying I'm a bit mad or I'm quite furious, it's probably the bot is not, is not uh, working in the way that I expect. So to finish that, I show you how it looks like. And if you adopt these continuous integration and, and delivery uh, practices, it will allow you to have an orchestra for yourself with some conductor that will help you to make your life easier. If you scale this up for a company, this will increase communication and collaboration. You can have a more reliable solution. And at, at the end of the day, it's setting you up to grow more from there. You can grow from the manual development to the pipelines that I just show you uh, to another point where you can think of fully automated processes. Like instead of using this, what I was showing you, an API to call the RASA API to bring the conversations, I could automate this job every day, 8 p.m. and run some preliminary scripts. And yeah, so this is like the, the next step. If you want to know more, uh, I have some links here. 
and I will make available this started project that you can fork. And from there, you can see how I, I orchestrated all of this using, using GitLab and Rasa from this project. You can just copy, change to your point it to your own server, and it will be ready to, to, to replicate what I just did or I just show you in this demo video. So thank you. I think this is, I have three minutes of so questions. <laughs> thank you very much, William. That was a very nice talk. Very interesting indeed. So we have one question. Um, the uh, question is that, uh, what are the cons and pros of GitLab CI CD versus having a Jenkins server? Okay. Well, if you already know Jenkins, so what are the pros and cons? Cons the learning curve. If like me, you came to this uh, CI CD without knowing Jenkins, so GitLab is very easy to learn. So that's one thing, learning curve. And, and one, one, one pro is that in GitLab, you have everything under the, uh, there are in a single app. You don't have to switch environment. For example, here, in this, I have in one single view, I have the pipelines here. I can define everything. And what I define in my project that will be my pipeline is automatically triggered and read by GitLab here, for example. So pros and cons. Pro, if you don't, if you if you are comfortable with learning this tool because it's very easy and everything is pre-integrated, uh, pre-integrated, and as I said, will make your life easier. So you don't have to know to think about okay. So I need to learn a new tool. I need to learn Jenkins plus Rasa plus my own development. Here, what I, what the, the reason I like this a lot is because here is everything. Everything is here under this single application, and whatever I push to my to my to this repository it will trigger a pipeline in, in, my, in my GitLab CI. So that's, what, that's something I can tell you from the point of view of a GitLab fan, but also personal point of view. If you really know Jenkins, Learning Corp, okay, go for the things you really know, because at the end of the day, you just want to make your life easier and deliver faster. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you for that answer. Um, there, there's a second question. I don't know whether we have time, but uh, is there a difference between GitLab CI CD and GitHub Actions? Well, yes, there are different products. Uh, yes, there are there are differences that is we can take it offline because I'm, it, this is moving me okay. into the conversation of competition. The, uh, <laughs> right. But okay. I can, yeah. I can, I can, I can, That's I can in the, in the, in the room, so, sorry, in the room, because all of this is, is public for, for, for GitLab. We have a competition page that if you Google, uh, mm -hmm. GitLab versus GitHub actions in Google, this is public and you will find it there. It's not like, it's not possible for me to talk. No, you can do it. And it's so transparent that you can have it only if you search for yourself, but it's a quite long topic. So, right. okay. Yeah. So let's take that maybe offline into the, into the talk chat. Uh, we posted the link on the, on the talk chat in discord. And, and so you can then find the talk room for this. So thank Perfect. you very much Arias for the very nice talk. Let me give you your applause. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm.